Hi, my name is uh, Gurmeet Manku. Uh, it brings me a lot of joy to share th- this video with you. It's about a somewhat complicated subject. It's about inflammation. Uh, there is uh, a concept of dietary inflammatory index. And in the process of explaining this thing called dietary inflammatory index, uh, we will also walk through fiber, like what is a high fiber a food plate. And then I will show you, show you connections between a high fiber food plate and something which is low in inflammation and the connection with whole food plant-based guidelines, especially low-fat whole food plant-based guidelines. And one of my motivations to have a, a highly anti-inflammatory diet for myself is to prevent cancer. There's a connection between the two. So then I'll walk us through AICR foods that fight cancer. So this is American Institute for Cancer Research. And then I'll showcase connection between this and this. And then in the end, I will uh, connect the big picture of nature cure guidelines or naturopathy guidelines from India and whole food plant-based guidelines. There's a sixth component. Um, it makes me excited just to even think about it. <laughs> it's called heart disease. There is a the same food plate uh, with a few minor tweaks is highly heart disease protective also. And that is uh, uh, Dr. Esselstein's work. So I'll make a separate video on that. But in this video, it's kind of a complex video, but let's see. <laughs> I'm trying to simplify it and covering a lot of ground here and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Let's start with anti-inflammatory diet. Okay. So in my personal life, about um, five years ago, I started having gout <laughs> in my foot. I was surprised. I had a pretty healthy lifestyle and yet I'm getting gout. So I kind of took care of it uh, in a, uh, without taking in any medicines and I managed. But in those days, uh, it took me a few months, I would say. In those days, I actually searched for anti-inflammatory food components and pro-inflammatory food components because gout is inflammation related. My motivation was, can I make my food plate uh, highly anti-inflammatory? Okay, and can I minimize and if possible eliminate any pro-inflammatory food that I can think of? That way, my whole food system becomes super anti-inflammatory, right? That was my thinking. Then I learned there is this concept called chronic inflammation, okay? Chronic inflammation is a very broad word. We have so many tissues in the body, uh, so many organ systems, and so any any of them can be inflamed, right? If it's prolonged inflammation for, let's say, weeks and weeks and months and years, uh, for example, it could be caused due to many, many reasons like uh, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, and many of those itis conditions, right? Uh, conditions that end in the word itis are inflammatory conditions. If I'm going through any of that for prolonged periods of time, my risk for cancer is going up, okay? There's a connection between the two. So I said, I really don't want cancer. I really don't want chronic inflammation. So is there a dietary component to this? So yes, there is a dietary component. There indeed are anti-inflammatory food and pro-inflammatory foods. And again, the same strategy. Uh, My motivation is to pack my food plate with as many anti-inflammatory foods as possible and minimize pro-inflammatory nature of my food plate. Okay, so these are the two motivations and I converged to a whole food plant-based food plate. Okay, (laughs) so it is by ACLM, American College of Lifestyle Medicine, LM. It's actually a specialty in mainstream medicine these days in USA. So doctors can get a license to practice lifestyle medicine, just like they get a license to practice cardiology, rheumatology, endocrinology, they can get a license to practice LM, lifestyle medicine. A non-doctor cannot get get that license. It's a medical specialty, okay? What I'm trying to say is, it is not like one or two doctors saying something. It's not fringe medicine. It's not uh, uh, some alternative medicine. It is mainstream medicine, but very few people know about it. Okay, so the food plate, as the show, is plant only, and it has uh, whole grains. Uh, These are beans, peas, legumes, or pulses, some nuts and seeds, fruits and vegetables, and some herbs and spices. On top of that, I follow the low-fat guideline, which is... uh, Approximately 10-12 total fat intake is my target. So I try to minimize my total fat intake. In the context of this food plate, that would mean uh, cutting down on nuts and seeds and being very careful. So I will skip all the details of what I do. I'm sharing the big picture with you. And what is my motivation to follow this low fat guideline on top of this whole food plant-based food plate? It comes from multiple sources of evidence. I'll make a separate video explaining why I do what I do. But briefly speaking, there are interventional studies by Ornish, Esselstein, Barnard uh, with fantastic results uh, for heart disease and diabetes. There is epidemiological uh, evidence, okay? Uh, Many, many cultures in the past have followed it, especially in the last 100 years. Uh, A few of them are well documented. And uh, Professor T. Colin Campbell's writings have uh, inspired me to understand, okay, it makes sense. And then comes these elegant videos by Dr. Peter Rogers. Uh, (laughs) He's too good. (laughs) 
he has uh, videos on pathophysiology and toxicology on what happens inside our body you know a mechanistic explanation in, in terms of biochemistry i was just floored <laughs> by watching his videos i learned a lot so when i look at all this uh, pieces of evidence i got convinced i must follow a low fat guideline okay so let's look at dietary inflammatory index okay because uh, so dietary inflammatory index is an attempt to classify foods into pro and anti inflammatory by chance i found a slide deck at aicr website american institute for cancer research uh, the slide deck is pretty good uh, it has lots of slides but i'll show you only a few okay and they have a slide saying chronic inflammation is implicated in cancer and other chronic diseases okay so here is one of the key slides uh, it is explaining the methodology of the dietary inflammatory index how was it constructed but i will skip all the details i'll just highlight the big picture okay and the big picture is that team actually did a literature survey they identified 1943 articles okay going back in time and they the nature of these articles is kind of you know there are foods or the foods with certain constituents or foods with certain properties so when we consume those foods then what happens to our inflammation markers so they picked uh, these well known inflammation markers like il6 interleukin 10 or crp you know something like this and then they studied uh, what causes an increase in these markers what causes a decrease in the markers and then they started classifying foods into pro inflammatory and anti inflammatory and then they also attempted to assign them numeric scores like what is more anti inflammatory and what is less anti inflammatory that is the nature of this work okay so this is like a high level overview of foods in terms of these impact on these inflammation markers so i thought is there a simple way to understand all this luckily yes so i searched for videos on youtube and here is a video by the lead uh, investigator for this uh, entire work uh, it's called dietary inflammatory index and this is a 3 minute video dr james hebert he says if i am eating a diet which is strongly anti inflammatory it's going to be plant based colorful aromatic that's it <laughs> that's the summary of the index okay but i think many of my friends and um, let's say my daughter watches this and uh, they might they, they might not be convinced by what is going on here and um, in that slide deck uh, so let's go into more details okay and it brings me joy to go through all these details uh, there is this slide i'm picking up from that same slide deck it's insightful and i really want to share what is said in this slide in terms of one more level of detail and it's interesting okay so the slide has three parts these are the anti inflammatory foods and food constituents these are the pro inflammatory food constituents and then there is a conclusion like uh, what do we do how do we put together this knowledge into a food plate composition dietary pattern okay so let's go through it step by step so what are the pro inflammatory foods as per the dietary in inflammatory index slide okay so these are the pro inflammatory foods you can see sat fats uh, which is a short form for saturated fatty acids trans fats which is trans fatty acids and dietary cholesterol Okay, um, so let's say I want to communicate this to my mom or my dad or my brother or my uh, uh, my brother's wife or my daughters, and I tell them, okay, I picked up this knowledge. It's fantastic. You know, for for reducing inflammation, minimize your dietary cholesterol, minimize your trans fats, minimize your saturated fatty acids. Each one of these individuals <laughs> will tell me. what are you talking about uh, tell me about what to eat what not to eat what is the sat fat trans fat cholesterol thing what are you talking about okay so we really need to understand <laughs> like in which foods are they found so that i could minimize those foods right that is that knowledge is missing in this uh, slide and this is common uh, it's a common challenge faced by many of us okay so let's study it before we study here is something uh, interesting so we also have institute of medicine okay this comes under nih uh, national institutes of health which is like the organization um, under the us government which studies health from so many perspectives so iom which is institute of medicine uh, they write these thick encyclopedic reports 1330 pages long dietary reference index so it's kind of an encyclopedia of all macro micronutrients okay like what is adequate intake of a micronutrient what is it, is it uh, the toxicology aspect of it you know is it upper limit or so this whole encyclopedia so somewhere they have this picture okay this table what does it say dietary cholesterol the recommendation is as low as possible trans fatty acids as low as possible saturated fatty acids trans fatty as possible coincidentally the same three things show up in this table also okay it's the same three things showing up in the dietary inflammatory uh, index work okay now what is the reasoning of iom 
that they are discussing it. Okay, let's see what the reasoning is. By chance, the reasoning also exists, and uh, let's go through it slowly so that um, it gets absorbed. What are they saying? Okay, they say there are no known risks of chronic disease associated with consuming diets very low in sat fats, trans fats, or cholesterol. What does this mean? So somebody like me who chooses to minimize my intake of uh, sat fats, trans fats, and cholesterol to very very low amounts of or zero if possible. an individual like me um uh, there is no known risk of chronic disease associated with this choice that i am making so it's assuring to know that uh, this sounds like a sound methodology okay of the methodology is to re- minimize reduce this intake okay next let, let's read this para a substantial body of evidence suggests that sat fats trans fats and cholesterol raise blood total and ldl cholesterol levels okay which in turn increases the risk of chd coronary heart disease Okay, substantial body of evidence that all three things, these three things called sat fats, trans fats, cholesterol, they increase something called blood chole- total and LDL cholesterol levels. What does that mean? So in my twenties, for example, uh, and thirties, uh, when I went to doctors for a general checkup, they would tell me we should also do a lipid profile test. So we should go and measure your total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides. Okay, all these complex numbers. <laughs> okay, all these complex concepts, and let's find these numbers. So why do we do all that? the idea is if we have high cholesterol levels or high ldl levels uh we are at higher risk for heart disease and heart attacks okay now these these are deadly potentially deadly uh indians have a very high rate of heart attacks and heart disease uh, i'll make a separate video which explains the incidence with which this happens it's surprisingly high asian indians which are people like me asian indian means indian americans like uh, people who uh, are originally from india and they are now in usa we have an extraordinarily high rate of uh, heart disease okay especially uh, so given all these i really want to minimize my heart disease risk and i do not want to drop dead because of a heart attack okay it doesn't make sense okay let's move further because there is a positive linear trend between intake of each of these fats and risk of coronary heart disease even very low intakes of each may increase risk okay it is thus recommended that intakes of sat fats trans fats and cholesterol remain as low as possible okay uh, Uh, so what are they saying so this is a positive linear trend between intake and chd and even very low amounts are known to uh, harm us so what's going on is this is called a dose response uh, curve in the sense that uh, uh, every incremental increase is leading to higher and higher risk so even at low amounts the risk exists so somebody like me who really doesn't want to drop dead due to heart attacks my strategy is to follow what iom is teaching us i really would like to minimize sat fats trans fats cholesterol in my food system okay <laughs> okay Okay, let's go step by step. Uh, dietary cholesterol, where is it found? Okay, and let's go back to the same slide I was analyzing from the perspective of dietary inflammatory index, and they mention it's a pro-inflammatory food. Okay, so dietary cholesterol, the picture is very clean, very clean story, simple to understand. Dietary cholesterol is found exclusively in animal products, which is meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Okay, and it is not found in uh, plant foods at all. It is so clear. Okay, so it's very easy to memorize and understand. And let's say somebody like me wants to minimize my dietary cholesterol intake, then the choice is just eat plant foods and forego animal products. So no meat, no fish, no eggs, dairy. Assures me that there is no dietary cholesterol coming into my body. So that's as it's as simple as that. Okay. Now trans fats. Okay, trans fats is a little more complex, but not that complex. It's uh, comprehensible. So let's build the trans fat story step by step. So we need to study two different types of foods. One is natural foods, and one is you know uh, ultra processed foods uh, produced in industry, like in industrial labs and kitchens. Okay, what are natural foods? So in the animal product world, the natural foods are you know freshly chopped meat or freshly cut meat or freshly farmed or caught fish. or uh, freshly laid eggs or you know fresh dairy that uh, was derived from some animal and then possibly pasteurized soon after this is all fresh food okay in the plant world the fresh food is actual whole grains actual uh, beans that have been harvested actual uh, fruits vegetables nuts and seeds herbs and spices the actual foods now these are natural foods okay among natural foods from the animal world and the plant world It's very clear. Trans fats are not found in plant foods at all. Okay, zero trans fats. Trans fats in the natural food world are found exclusively in 
animal products <laughs> okay and in all of them <laughs> they they all have uh, trans fats i believe <laughs> so now comes this concept of what i'm calling fake foods okay what is fake food okay this is a kind of a pejorative term i hope uh, people don't get annoyed with it <laughs> so in my view uh, foods which are prepared in somebody else's kitchen okay uh, in an especially in the industrial setting with high temperature pressure all sorts of physical processing all sorts of chemical processing we can transform food into all sorts of strange substances which look like food but is it really food or not okay that that question comes to my mind so i prefer to buy actual whole foods and cook them in my own kitchen at home and i allocate time daily to do that so anything that is not done this way sitting in the industrial kitchen is all fake foods in particular industrially processed partially hydrogenated oils have trans fats in them and these come from plant foods and that is the confusing part we can use plants and uh, start creating trans fats in this complex way <laughs> through industrial processing and now what is the problem the problem is that uh, these oils and uh, similar uh, derivatives can be used and are used in a lot of processed foods it's like across the board so here is a small diagram from nutrition facts a video i forgot to link uh, the video according to some study 79% of trans fats intake in the us diet came from all these processed foods like cakes cookies crackers pies bread potato chips corn chips okay all sorts of stuff and this shortening and 21% came from animal products so my strategy as an individual who wants to minimize my trans fats intake is to forego these two sources of food so no animal products for me and no ultra processed foods for me i would prefer to cook everything or prepare everything in my own kitchen is that an okay thing to do to have none of this stuff and no trans fat intake well the same uh, institute of medicine you know uh, they write this encyclopedic report on maximum micronutrients they assure me trans fatty acids are not essential okay from a dietary perspective uh, and provide no known benefit to human health and they also say any incremental increase in trans fat acid intake increases chd coronary heart disease risk okay so it's an okay choice to make no trans fats intake in my diet okay all right let's come to sat fats <sighs> sat fats is a complex subject <laughs> it is not simple <laughs> there are two sources of complexity one there are different types of sat fats there are these long chain medium chain and uh, short chain and where are they found and uh, where are they produced in the body and what is the impact on our health it's kind of a complicated discussion okay um, one where are they found and second you know different types of sat fats but let me try to simplify this whole complex discussion uh, by sharing with you how i have reasoned about it and how i have constructed my own food plates what is how do i do it okay okay let's go step by step uh, sat fats saturated fatty acids uh, are found in both plants and animal derived foods both <laughs> okay now in high quantities it's found in meat fish eggs and dairy so animal foods have high amounts of saturated fats and in the plant world a few specific uh, foods like uh, coconut and coconut derivatives and palm and palm kernel and derivatives and cocoa beans and you know derivatives like cocoa nibs they have high amounts of saturated fats uh an attempt to saturated fats is made in the animal world by making low fat versions of these uh, products for example Uh, lean meat uh, will be attempted right so we throw away the obvious uh, uh, fatty part of uh, uh, for example chicken and we are left with lean chicken or lean meat and in the dairy world an attempt is made to reduce the fat content through things like uh, 2% fat 1% fat low fat double toned milk skimmed milk all these sorts of milks uh, are being attempted right so as part of that exercise of reducing the fat intake sat fat intake also goes down but it never becomes zero <laughs> okay <laughs> so that's a tricky part and it still remains substantial if we are eating animal foods okay now how do i minimize my sat fat intake even if i forgo both of these the the high sources i'm still left with nuts seeds olives avocados they have sat fats and it's found in trace amounts in whole grains and beans and vegetables so what what do i do how do i uh, approach this okay uh, before i go there i wanted to mention i should have made some slides on that uh sat fat minimization is a common dietary guideline across the board okay who guidelines uh, usda guidelines united states uh, government guidelines right and canadian food guide uh, uh, american heart association uh, guidelines each and every organization says minimized saturated fats okay they they are well known 
Okay, so my strategy is to adopt a low-fat guideline. My total fat intake, my target is 10-12% of total fat, uh, total calories should be fats. Okay, whether they have succeeded or not, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I should have put my food in chronometer, but I think I'm there. Uh, low-fat guideline. So as part of this low-fat guideline, how do I execute it? So I have to remove these uh, high-fat food sources for sure because the moment I eat even a little bit of this, I will exceed this threshold easily because a few percentage points of uh, fats come from these things which are low in fat. We, we don't even see them as fat sources like whole grains and beans. They have fats in them, little, little. So a rule of thumb is 2-3% fat in any whole food plant-based uh, food plate starts coming from here. And uh, with just a few, uh, like a few tablespoons of seeds, we start crossing this threshold. Okay, so there is not much room for consuming any of this stuff if somebody follows a low-fat guideline. So that is what I do. And that's how even the moderate uh, sat-fat sources are eaten in very small quantities for me. And that is how my sat-fat intake has become very low. Okay. So why do I follow the low-fat guideline? As I told you before, I'm inspired by multiple lines of evidence, interventional studies, epidemiological studies, pathophysiology studies. Okay, Just to illustrate uh, that it's not something that unusual, I'll pick one data point, one epidemiological uh, data point, and showcase uh, that it's not that unusual Okay, <laughs> to have such low-fat intake. It's acceptable. So the example I have picked up is traditional Okinawan diet. Okay, So... Some of you might be familiar with the, the blue zones okay, by Dan Butner. So blue zones are like, uh, I forgot, five or six places in the world. These populations have amazing lifespan and health span. By lifespan is meant longevity. They live quite long, surprisingly long. And one metric is the fraction of population that, it, that is able to cross age 100 is very high in these places. A lot of people in the 90s and 100s, surprisingly high. And they also have good health span. So they are not falling sick. They are not falling apart. Uh, their incidence of chronic lifestyle diseases, especially the NCDs, non-communicable diseases like uh, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and also the cancers, is very low, <laughs> okay? So they are healthy populations living till 100, 100 plus, uh, quite a few people. So now Okinawans, uh, Okinawa is an island in in Japan, and the traditional Okinawans are one of these uh, revered populations with both lifespan and health span, one of the blue zone populations. Now way back in 1940s and 50s, studies were done, okay, what do these people do? Especially food-wise, and here is the classic uh, paper which gets cited often, the Okinawan uh, had a 6% fat intake, and the Japan as a whole, uh, you know, uh, they were also pretty healthy and they had 8% total fat intake. So the only reason I'm bringing all this up is that uh, a low-fat diet, uh, which is even below 10%, is is not that unusual. Okay, Today it might sound unusual because a lot of uh, people are consuming 25% fat and 30% fat and 40% fat. And, you know, uh, we, we, we may not even have heard that such populations existed. Okay. And this is not the only example. There were many, many populations in rural Africa, uh, Asia, uh, rural China, uh, Japan, uh, in South America. Multiple populations used to have that kind of a food system, low fat and approximately a whole food plant-based food system. But I'll go to, into all those details later. I was just trying to assure <laughs> somebody who's watching this video that it's not that unusual a choice to have such a low fat uh, whole food plant-based food system. Okay. Okay, what are anti-inflammatory foods? So we just covered pro-inflammatory foods. What are anti-inflammatory foods as per that same slide? Okay, this box here is a little bit uh, complicated, but it's also simple at the same time. Let's look at the simple part first. The simple part is that uh, they list actual foods which I can make sense of. They say something, phytochemicals and micronutrients found in fruits and vegetables. Eat this stuff. This is anti-inflammatory. They say fiber, which I have to now scratch my head, think, what is fiber? Where is it found? I'll come to that. Uh, whole grains, I can make sense of it. Spices and seasonings. So I kind of understand what to do here except for the fiber part. Okay. So let me let me explain one concept here that comes to my mind. For example, when I have fallen sick in the past uh, due to, let's say, a viral infection or a bacterial infection, then I kind of know, yeah, it's uh, it's that infection. It will go away in three days, four days, five days, maybe seven days, maybe 10 days. But if I were to consume some anti-inflammatory mixture uh, of herbs and spices, then I think I can recover faster because it's anti-inflammatory. It will fight uh, all that inflammation in the body. Motivated by such thinking, I have, since I have been trained from childhood to do this, I will call my mom and ask her, okay, what are these anti-inflammatory herbs and spices? How can I assemble them? Is there like a mixture I can make? Or I will ask some friends and I will consume them. 
in the form of teas right put them in hot water and sip them or uh, so such combinations are found all over the world and all over india in many states there is some kashmir chai that they do in punjab side i forgot i think it's called kadha okay uh, the tamil nadu people will have something else it's kind of the standard thing we do okay now if you look at nature cure or naturopathy guidelines i have heard that they view all these spices and uh, herbs the special herbs that we eating they see them as medicines <laughs> okay we see them as food they see them as medicines technically we don't really need the spices and herbs for nutritional adequacy what does that mean uh, as per uh, the nutrition uh, scientific knowledge that we have accumulated from the western perspective we need some macronutrients like proteins carbohydrates and fats we need some micronutrients like vitamins minerals phytochemicals so we can derive them without all these spices okay we can if we choose to so they are optional in some sense they are not a requirement they are very helpful because they help us uh, fight uh, health problems but they are not required now the nature care practitioners my understanding is uh, some of them say these are actually medicines so in some sense we are consuming medicines uh, without food all the time <laughs> okay <laughs> it's a perspective now uh, another perspective is many of us uh, believe that it's okay to eat whatever we are eating for example it's okay to eat even pro inflammatory food components in our food plates but whenever we fall sick we can counter the effects of these pro inflammatory foods by eating extra spices and seasonings okay so an emphasis is on all these special foods like herbs and spices when we think about anti inflammatory foods so one thing i want to point out is i'm not sure if that is sound uh, methodology if you kind of look at this uh, dietary inflammatory index what have they figured out from studying 1943 papers okay they have multiple bullet points here <laughs> they say phytochemicals and micronutrients in fruits and vegetables are also anti inflammatory fiber and whole grains are also anti inflammatory so the baseline food system can be made highly anti inflammatory not just through spices and seasonings all this other stuff is also <laughs> helping us fight inflammation and if we can somehow understand how to minimize these pro inflammatory foods that that also helps us fight inflammation so conceptually if we were to focus on the baseline food system without the herbs and spices and make it highly anti inflammatory then would we need all these herbs and spices my understanding is no we don't need so many herbs and spices and my understanding is we will also fall less sick because our body will not be inflamed we can fight infections better and we will not those occasions when we need all these spices and herbs and kadha and the, the special teas will also reduce so do you see what i'm trying to say we should really try to fix our baseline food system and not just rely on special foods and medicines uh, when we fall sick okay that's kind of uh, what i'm uh, trying to say okay let's come back to this uh, slide and let's analyze it in a little more detail uh let's see all these code words what is this phytochemical micronutrient and then we'll go to fiber okay phytochemicals and micronutrients so where are they found and what are these things phytochemicals are found in both animal foods and plant foods but they are found in abundance in plant foods in all this beautiful medley of uh, rainbow colored fruits and vegetables okay now remember many of those uh, fruits and vegetables have edible skins for example apple apple has a skin we can bite into it we can eat it many times the fruits and vegetables the skin has a different color then what is inside apple is an example <laughs> okay apple has that uh, lush red and sometimes i have seen green apples but it's different from the inside the inside is always that uh, creamish whitish color there is a lot of phytochemicals sitting in those outside skins the outside edible peels and skins of uh, these whole foods are packed with nutrition so that's why i prefer to eat them with their skin <laughs> okay the same uh, methodology also applies to grains and beans those outer uh, surfaces have a lot of micronutrients in them and so if we start polishing them and we eat only the inner part we lose we lose phytochemicals those colorful things and uh, micronutrients and antioxidant capacity in general will go down okay we really should go after rainbow colored food plates fruits and vegetables with the skin <laughs> okay so this is a video by dr gregor in which he basically laments that uh, you know we we don't really have phytochemicals listed on nutrition facts if we somehow develop the methodology to measure them and associate uh, the quantity with each and every food group and start putting them here we might get motivated to make our food plates even more nutritious right because we will know how much phytochemical but we don't have this uh, it's it's missing Okay, let's go to micronutrients. Uh, 
it's a very complex topic. Micronutrients is a very broad term covering vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, like a lot of stuff. But how do you reason about where are they found? Because there are so many of them and there are so many foods. So we need a methodology to understand how to pick foods which are rich in micronutrients because there are so many of them. And then how do you pick food groups and stuff? So this is a very elegant video. It's a methodological video, which I encourage my friends to watch. It's worth watching. It's very good to understand how we can reason that plant foods are the one that maximize micronutrients per calorie. Okay. So I'll skip the details and let's go to fiber, the third component, which is the anti-inflammatory component in this slide. So I'll share with you four points. Fiber is relatively easy to understand. Animal products have zero fiber and fiber is found exclusively in plants. It's so clear. Okay. So meat, fish, eggs milk and dairy products have no fiber at all. And if we were to take milk and do transformations, like we create yogurt out of it, or the, we, we create buttermilk or chaach or butter, or the, um, the cream, cheese, yogurt, and paneer, mava, khoya, none of these transformations creates any fiber. All of these are zero fiber foods, no fiber in them, okay? So second point is, in the world we have three macronutrient extracts, proteins, fats and carbohydrates and we can extract them using um, chemical processes. Protein extracts are not consumed very often. They exist but they are not consumed very often. So let's focus on uh, fat extracts and carbohydrate extracts because they are consumed in large quantities in populations worldwide. So oils are fat extracts, refined sugars are carbohydrate extracts, neither of them has any fiber at all. No fiber. Okay, <laughs> it's a fiber free food. Okay, refined grains are fiber deficient. So what is a refined grain? Okay, a grain has three parts. A whole grain has three parts, bran, germ, and sperm. The bran and germ is the outer part of the grain, but many of us uh, instinctually seek the endosperm rich inner part of the whole grain. Why? Because it's um, carbohydrate rich, sweetish, it appeals to our uh, taste, it gives us instant energy, it metabolizes faster, especially if we convert it to a flour. And the shelf life improves if we do this transformation of polishing away the bran and germ. But in the process of polishing the bran and germ, what do, what do we lose? What is the loss from a nutritional perspective? Huge. Okay, the, the loss is all these micronutrients are lost. Okay, and one of the micronutrients is fiber is lost. Okay, it's not lost completely, but it's uh, reduced. Let's see. This is brown rice, the green bars, and this is white rice, uh, the red bars, and fiber became one third of the total value. So white rice has approximately one third the fiber of brown rice. The similar something similar happens in whole wheat. This is these green bars are whole wheat flour, and the red bars are refined wheat flour, which have one quarter of the fiber of the whole wheat flour. So 75% is gone. So these two, for example, you know, in the wheat world, we can create white flour. We can also create semolina, suji, rava. Okay, in this also, the bran and germ has been polished. Uh, so there is a loss of bran and germ to some degree. Uh, <laughs> In the rice world, we have white rice, and white rice can be converted to poha, we can flatten it, we can puff it to make murmunas, we can make rice crackers. All of these white rice and derivatives are polished. So I stay away from both. I will go after actual whole grains. In the millet world, we have two of them, hulled and pulled, and hulled has more bran and germ, so I will prefer hulled than pulled. Okay, last point. Ultra processed foods are often, not always, uh, often fiber deficient. And for this reason, you know, uh, doctors like Dr. Gregor, they have devised rules of thumb. Uh, okay, if we really want to go and eat ultra processed foods, which might happen in case of emergencies, uh, that we really have to go and feed ourselves, we don't really have any real food, and let's uh, find some ultra processed food, it might happen. And if somebody wants to maximize their uh, fiber intake, then there are all these rules of thumb. What I do is, I don't go after these rules, they are too complex, I have to study food labels, I have to uh, look at fiber and carbohydrates and do some calculation, okay, <laughs> I don't do this. What I do is, I try my best not to touch, not to buy any ultra processed foods at all. So that is my strategy. So let's look at the overall strategy. So we covered pro-inflammatory foods, we covered anti-inflammatory foods, now how do we put together all this knowledge into constructing an actual food plate? What is the strategy? So. Fiber, as I told you, these uh, four points, right, and five point, they actually come together beautifully into this whole food plant-based food plate. Let's see how. So this whole food plant-based food plate is plant only, okay? This is fruits and vegetables on the left and calorie-dense uh, plant foods like whole grains, beans, and nuts and seeds on the right-hand side. At the bottom, they say herbs and spices, there is water, and we really should have B12. So fiber is found exclusively in plants. This is all plants, <laughs> okay? Animal foods have zero fiber, no animal foods. 
oil and zero we have no oils no sugar in the whole food plant based system because they are not whole foods okay they are derivatives they are extracts oil and sugar are extracts the fine grains the polished grains are fiber deficient but we consume whole grains in whole food plant based ultra processed foods are often fiber deficient and we don't consume ultra processed foods if we stick to this methodology because so that's how you know uh, it's a supremely fiber rich uh, food plate okay just to illustrate a small point Uh, I found this Indian migration study. It was done in uh, 2000. Uh, f- it's based on this data from 2005, 2007. I think the paper is from 2014. They looked at this data set, and this is uh, a study whose goal was to understand what happens to us from a nutrition perspective and from a health perspective as people migrate from rural areas to urban areas. So it's a sibling study. One sibling remained in a rural area, and the another a sibling moved to urban areas, and then they compared what they eat and. Uh, they measure a lot of variables, but let's just look at one one variable which I found. So the, the so among the siblings, you know, some are vegetarians and some are non-vegetarians, but it didn't really matter, okay. And there are a few thousand people that they studied, okay. So it's a large size study. The total calories were comparable: twenty seven hundred here, twenty seven hundred here, okay. But the fiber intake is so low; it's like thirteen point seven, twelve point eight. So 13 to 14 grams of fiber on a 2700 calorie diet is very low. Okay, if you just look at any nutritional guidelines from anywhere, WHO guideline, uh, we can look at, we look at ICMR guidelines in India, USDA guidelines, Canadian Food Guide, American Heart Association guide. Pick any uh, any of these guidelines, they will all say uh, at least 25 grams of fiber. Um, some will say 30. Uh, for, for sometimes they will say men should have a little higher, 38, 40. It's all different, but 13 is very low. 13, 14 is too low. Okay. Now, if we construct food plates according to this methodology, our fiber intake is too much. Okay, it'll easily be 60 grams, and then maybe 80 grams, possibly 100 grams. It, it, it's just too much. It, it, it's okay. So a high fiber food plate like this has a lot of health benefits. I'll I'll make a video separately. Okay, in, just in case somebody wants to look at detailed data in the Indian migration study, you can look at Lucknow, Nagpur, Hyderabad, Bangalore, and you know individuals like uh, rural areas, migrant migrants, and urban across the board. There is very low fiber going on. Okay, okay, so this is the strategy I follow, the high fiber strategy. Uh, so so far, I showed you that the this food, this component, the anti-inflammatory component, matches beautifully this whole food plant based food plate. Now let's look at the pro-inflammatory component. So remember, I told you uh, trans fats are found in natural foods only in the animal products, and plant foods don't have any trans fats. But trans fats can also be created using those uh, hydrogenated oils, or partially hydrogenated oils, which are found in uh, processed foods. So if I forego, if I don't consume any processed foods at all, my trans fats intake becomes zero. <laughs> okay, no meat, no fish, next, no eggs, dairy for me, no processed foods for me, no ultra processed foods for me, and my trans fat intake is zero. Cholesterol is found uh, exclusively in animal foods. Plant foods don't have trans fat, uh, cholesterol, dietary cholesterol. So these two are easy. Sat fat is complicated. So for sat fat, what I do is uh, I stay away from high sat fat foods, which are like the coconut and coconut derivatives, palm, palm kernel derivatives, and cocoa beans and cocoa nibs. And even the nuts and seeds and avocados, I minimize their intake because I choose to follow the low fat guideline. Okay, and. Okay, let's look at the third part of the slide here. So, how do we put these two pieces of information together to construct a food system? So, I showed you I follow this food system, but this is not the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet is a slightly different uh, food system, in which uh, meat, fish, eggs, dairy is a part of the food system. Okay, it is much much healthier than standard American diet. So, standard American diet is a term used to describe what we are eating in USA on an average. As compared to that, this is a supremely superior system. Mediterranean diet is much much better. Okay, so, but is it true that the Mediterranean diet has really optimized the inflammation? Uh, you can say the dietary inflammatory index. Okay, is it the best according to these two? A Mediterranean diet continues to have some trans fats, continues to have some cholesterol, and has it really minimized saturated fats? Okay, my claim is that uh, the low-fat whole food plant-based guideline. Tightens these knobs the best. It just removes trans fats, removes cholesterol, and really minimizes saturated fats with this strategy. And by removal of the high sat fat foods, you see what's going on. The tightening of the knobs is superior in the low fat whole food plant based guidelines. And on that basis, I believe uh, this low fat whole food plant based guideline, uh, the food system I follow, is highly anti-inflammatory. Okay. Okay. 
uh, a little bit of uh, omega 3 versus omega 6 discussion because um, this was not part of the slide that we were analyzing so this is a, again a very complex discussion there are these two pathways in our body the omega 3 pathway omega 6 pathway the omega 3 omega 6 ratio matters how do we measure we have adequacy in our intake how do we measure them in the blood it's all too complicated okay and many uh, parts of this whole story are not uh, precisely known but yet we have to move forward and um, we have to make judgment calls and do something okay so i'll share with you what i do um, so i'll just share you an interesting tidbit um omega 3 to omega 6 ratio should be positive like more omega 3s the reason is uh, in normal food plates omega 6s are just too many sometimes the ratio is i don't know 20 is to 1 50 is to 1 200 is to 1 omega 6 to omega 3 ratio that's uh, not a good thing <laughs> we should really have swing it in the direction of omega 3 okay and an attempt is made to go in that direction by consuming foods in which omega 3s are much more than omega 6s so in the nuts and seeds world these two seeds stand out they are outliers flax and chia look at the omega 3 6 ratio it's like 4 or 3 and look at all these other seeds and nuts in nuts like peanuts and almonds it's extremely other way around look at the 6 to 3 ratio 5000 <laughs> is to okay do you see what's going on so because of this reason uh, i choose to go for just flax and chia in my food plates okay um, and that is what esselstein will also recommend now who is a dr esselstein uh, this presentation is kind of complex i am sharing a lot of piece of information with you so a lot of this might be new and strange words but uh, please be patient so esselstein is one of the whole food plant based luminaries who has chalked out guidelines for heart disease prevention stupendous results in uh, interventional studies uh, he is an icon in whole food plant based guidelines very strict guidelines especially the fat intake he will say uh, go for 10% fat intake if you have heart disease now a person like me even without heart disease chooses to use that threshold for good reasons i'll make a separate video explaining why i choose 10% fat intake even though i don't have heart disease okay it's for prevention purposes okay so he says high nuts are highly addictive no nuts uh, and he says omega 3s which are the efa essential fatty acids he says just take one two tablespoon of flax and chia we are done <laughs> okay it may be surprising how it all happens but i i thought i'll briefly mention what is my omega 3 strategy it is like this now to really understand this in depth um, we need uh, we need to read more articles and stuff i thought i'll briefly share with you the omega 3 omega 6 strategy i have in place but uh, last couple of years i got influenced by the uh, let me go here by the very low fat uh, strategy now there is <laughs> we can <laughs> potentially reduce our total fat intake even lower than the 10% and i learned about all this through dr peter rajesh's videos so these are the, uh, super advanced whole food plant based guidelines uh, these go beyond well established well agree agreed upon whole food plant based guidelines and i have started exploring these okay uh, so th th there's a history of uh, researchers and scientists like dr kempner going back to 1940s nathan pritikin dr mcdougal and now dr peter rogers and i learned a lot from his videos uh, expository videos fast paced information rich mind blowing <laughs> it's he's very good so is it okay to go below 10% and if we do that then you know we don't have to eat uh, even those <laughs> tablespoons of uh, flax and chia that also can be reduced okay i just thought i'll mention it and uh, just to hint that it may be okay to go less than 10% is my illustration uh, is okinawans had 6% fat one of the famed blue zone populations and japan had 8% fat okay so it's not unusual so let me come back to regular whole food plant based guidelines which are widely agreed upon the widely agreed upon guideline is, is that flax and chia is okay and uh, uh 10 and some 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 doctors will say even 15% fat intake is okay so uh, very few doctors encourage less than 10% fat uh, most people most doctors are in the 10 15% uh, range so dr greger specifically has uh, identified flax seed as very special and i want to point out dr greger is again one of these whole food plant based luminaries and he has this complicated 12 component uh, food system but it's very elegant once you understand nutrition i started appreciating the elegance in this food system <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a work of art once uh, people understand how this is constructed there's amazing reasoning behind each and every food component how it's <laughs> a part of this okay i wish i could share my joy with others if uh, some of my friends were to really understand nutrition then i can uh, you know exchange uh, notes with them uh, i don't know a single person <laughs> who understands this <laughs> and can appreciate my joy when i see elegance in this uh, food system <laughs> anyways so he has carved out one specific component is just one specific food you know 
all the others are groups. Like berries is a class of foods, bunch of berries. Beans are the class of uh, beans, different beans put together. But flaxseed is just one specific food. He calls flaxseed so special that he says one of the imp- components is flaxseed. Now, flaxseed have this omega-3, omega-6 ratio, which I just told you, but they also have lignans and the interventional studies and Dr. Greg has multiple videos and th- there's good reasoning behind why, why flaxseed is being like, encouraged here. Okay, I thought I'll just point this out. Um, so let's move forward. Uh, remember, uh, um, let's look at AICR guidelines, American Institute of Cancer Research. Remember, one of my motivations was I really don't want chronic inflammation because I'm trying to prevent cancer. I really don't want cancer, okay? Um, chronic inflammation is not the only cause of cancer, but um, I really don't want chronic inflammation. So let's look at cancer organizations. What do they say? And do they say something that matches the dietary inflammatory index that we just studied in depth? Okay, so AICR foods that fight cancer. American Institute for Cancer Research has this picture in this article. Let's see what they say. So they say whole grains, uh, two pictures of beans, two pictures of nuts and seeds, two pictures of beverages, 19 pictures of fruits and vegetables. So what is going on here, do you see? I wish they had also listed herbs and spices and mushrooms, but looks like the degree of evidence uh, was not sufficient to uh, make this list here. And hopefully in the next iteration, this is made, maybe we'll see some herbs and spices and mushrooms also. But notice, there are no animal foods listed here. There's no meat, no fish, no eggs, no milk, and no dairy products. There's no ghee, butter, milk, chaj, paneer, khoya, mava. None of that is here. Uh, no macronutrient extracts are listed. There's no oils, no fat extracts, no sugars, which are carbohydrate extracts. There's no processed foods listed here. Uh, there are no refined grains listed here. These are actual whole plant foods listed here. Okay. Now, to me, it's identical to this thing. Whole food, plant-based food plate. Exactly the same stuff is listed here. Okay, I, I thought I'll just showcase this to you. So AICR also has uh, uh, this picture, uh, which is uh, 10 guidelines for cancer prevention. Six of them have to do with what we put in our mouth. Five of them are kind of negatives in the sense, you know, uh, limit something, uh, attenuate something, reduce something. Um, one of them is positive. It is eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruit, and beans, okay? They also have this concept of one-third, two-third plate. Uh, they call it the new American plate. So the idea is one-third of the food plate or less is animal protein, and uh, two-third or more is whole grain fruits, uh, vegetables, and beans, okay? But look at the or less and the or more part. It's very important. So one-third or less, so we may choose to reduce it and we may choose to amplify the plant component. And is that okay? Does AICR say it's okay? Let's see. In the article called New American Plate, in which they define the one-third, two-third uh, concept, they have these four pictures, okay? This is the old American plate, and they say, you know, go to a transitional plate with less meat, more plants, and come to the new American plate with less meat, more plants. But they have a stage four in this journey. It's called another option. Uh, now, what is this another option? Let's look at the three sentences. In a one-pot meal, like the stir-fry, you can reduce the animal foods and increase the plant-based ingredients without even noticing. So they're saying, less meat, more plants, okay? Let's look at the second sentence. What is the reasoning behind it? This plate is bursting with colorful vegetables, hearty whole grains, cancer-fighting, vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals. Do you see the reasoning going on here? And then, what is the role of animal products? Fish, poultry, or occasional red meat is used as a complement, adding a bit of flavor and extra substance to the meal. Now, this is a cancer organization, American Institute for Cancer Research. What are they saying? Eat like this. Okay, so do you see why uh, I have adopted the whole food plant-based guidelines? Uh, They seem to be in harmony with what AICR is also teaching us. Okay, and this is the last component in that picture I was trying to build for you. A rather complicated picture and I'm covering a lot of uh, points here, but uh, this is the last one. Nature Cure Guidelines. Okay, so Nature Cure and Naturopathy is an ancient healing system from India. Okay, ancient. Uh, my understanding is it's actually practiced by many, many practitioners worldwide, here and there, here and there. They don't even know each other. Um, it's practiced by so few people, so few people know. Many people have not even heard this concept, nature cure, naturopathy, what is this? Okay, when did I hear about it? I think I heard about it in 2019. Uh, just four years ago, okay, <laughs> this is, and I, I was born in 1970s. I had not heard this concept, okay, and I'm born in India. I spent uh, 20, 25 years in India. So uh, even after I came in touch with whole food plant-based guidelines, and I'm practicing whole food plant-based, so many years passed, I had not heard of this concept, nature cure, naturopathy. Do you know what's going on? So few people 
know it and so few people practice it but it's there okay okay now this system the healing system nature cure naturopathy is actually protected and promoted by ayush ministry the government of india okay um mahatma gandhi was a huge fan of nature cure and naturopathy okay uh, for example naturopathy day in india is 18th november and it's in memory of something that mahatma gandhi did he founded this all india nature cure foundation way back in 1945 okay so what is nature cure naturopathy it's a multifaceted system one of which is the dietary component uh, many people come in touch with nature cure through the dietary aspect of it so the diet revolves around this beautiful concept which always brings me joy kand mool phal phool patti pani what is this stuff okay this phrase is the peaceful forest dwellers food system from ancient india what is this peaceful forest dweller who are these peaceful forest dwellers okay in india there is this uh, ancient tradition of you know living in forests for pursuing meditation and spiritual journeys right uh, like a saint or a sage person they will go live away from hamlets and villages and cities because they are pursuing meditation in a forest okay <laughs> this <laughs> so what do they eat now because they are peaceful they don't go and kill animals they are not hunting they are not killing animals and birds and uh, reptiles and snakes and worms they don't eat that they eat plants okay they eat kand mool phal phool patti pani kand mool is the root vegetables the kand part is starch rich uh, shakarkandi and uh, uh, jimmy kand kind of vegetables in english we call them uh, 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 sweet potatoes and yams the mool part is the less starchy uh, root vegetables like uh, beet and carrots and uh, radishes okay so kand mool is root vegetables phal phool my modern interpretation is uh, fruits and vegetables patti pani is leafy greens and water the whole thing is basically fruits and vegetables can we construct a nutritionally complete food system with just this stuff my understanding is yes and there are practitioners in usa i have come across they actually give seminars and uh, I, i can show you those practitioners and you can start understanding how it is done it's a very difficult food system very few people do it but it is possible even from the western nutrition perspective and very very few people <laughs> know this stuff very few people attempt it i have not reached there myself i know it conceptually i am trying to reach there i haven't reached there myself but okay in in the modern world we don't have to subsist only on kandmul phalphul patipani okay we can in the spirit of what uh, they are eating they are eating plant foods we can also eat grains and beans which are the project products of agriculture okay now those saint and sages they were not having a constant supply of grains and beans from villages and hamlets they live in forests and they live on kandmul phalphul patipani but as a city dweller as a village dweller we can we also have access to grains and beans okay so we can eat them and then the system becomes much much easier to follow in the modern world okay and we we have some nuts and seeds we could eat we have herbs and spices put all this together and it's very easy to follow if somebody wants to follow okay <laughs> these two food systems are identical if you look at uh, the the food groups the whole food plant based food group is also the same stuff okay <laughs> fruits and vegetables this is the kandmul phalphul patti pani on the left this is whole grains and beans and you can call them pulses and nuts and seeds and herbs and spices exactly the same thing okay this is what brings me joy that you know the Uh, the mainstream uh, medical uh, medicine folks in USA have carved out American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which corroborates an ancient healing and food system from India, and I think it's in many other parts of the world, maintained by very few people, esoteric people here and there. It's so beautiful. I find elegance in this. Okay, this food system, as I have tried to demonstrate in this particular presentation, is highly anti-inflammatory from the dietary inflammatory um, index perspective. It is a supremely fiber-rich system. why does fiber matter maybe i'll make another video and demonstrate why but i think it's uh, many people know a supremely fiber rich diet is very very helpful um uh, it is also an anti cancer system i'm trying to show you what aicr is teaching us okay american institute of cancer research it is also a supremely heart healthy food system okay um i have to make a couple of more videos to showcase dr s l stein study uh, and showcase populations with zero heart attacks zero heart disease okay so it's mind blowing how uh, how it happens okay let's move forward So, if somebody wants uh, to understand what is nature cure, naturopathy, how do they talk? What do they say? Well, I have listed four names here. Uh, there are many practitioners in India, hundreds and thousands, but these four come to my mind because I have watched their videos, all four, and uh, they are on YouTube. Okay, and they have a web presence. So, 
here are the five perspectives and i'm bringing this presentation to a closure it brings me joy and excitement to show you uh, i'm trying to sh paint the following picture here it's kind of the elephant and the five blind men you've heard the story right there's like a complicated thing we're trying to understand and five blind men are touching different parts of the ele elephant somebody touches the tail they think it is like this somebody touches the foot uh, of the elephant somebody touches the uh, what is it called uh, the nose of the elephant um the trunk of the elephant and they think it's all different but you know it's all th the same thing <laughs> okay so what were the five things we covered my original motivation was to find a supremely anti inflammatory food plot okay and i went through dietary inf inflammatory index through this one slide i wanted to go into great details to understand what's going on it so happens that to discuss this we need to understand fiber so how do you maximize fiber you know and we went through this fiber and it corresponds to this whole food plant based food plate especially the low low fat and then i showed you uh, what is aicr teaching us and one of my motivations for dietary inflammatory index to maximize was to reduce my cancer risk right and aicr is coming from cancer perspective what do they teach they say the same thing <laughs> and then there was the nature cure that teaches this stuff and by chance if you remember the uh, there was that iom institute of medicine motivation to reduce those uh, pro inflammatory foods they were coming from heart heart disease perspective all these perspectives as i'm trying to showcase they all point at something that something can be seen like this they can be seen like this you can see it like this <laughs> you can see it like this it's the same thing okay i hope uh, you can also derive the kind of joy i get by seeing all these interconnections and i hope um, uh, it was interesting for you and i hope you study this further and see <laughs> all these interconnections for yourself okay so i'm collecting articles and information at uh, thankful to plants uh, it's a website i'm making um if you like these videos please like and subscribe and share it uh, thank you so much